Dr. Hewitt, just a couple of points relating to transfusion practice I wanted to pick up with you next. Um, you've referred to the fact that patients, there'll be some patients who don't know they've been transfused. And I just wanted to look at an article which you co-authored in relation to that. WITN 3101017. So this is a 1999 publication. Do patients know they have been transfused? Patients continue to express concern about receiving a blood transfusion despite transfusion in the UK being safer now than ever before. However, not all patients who have been transfused are aware of this fact. We determined the proportion of patients who were aware of their transfusion and showed how awareness has changed with time. And then we, we pick it up halfway through the next paragraph you described the study, between May 1995 and May 1996, 3,239 recruits to the study were asked within two weeks of their transfusion whether they were aware that they had received a blood transfusion. This question was asked in a standard way. Patients who were not certain but believed they might have been transfused were counted as being aware. We did not determine if any specific information or consent procedures relating to transfusion were being used at the hospitals but simply identified what proportion of patients did not know that they had been transfused. Next paragraph, in total, 537 of 3,239, so 17% patients, were not aware uh, that they had been transfused. And then if we go over the page, um, if we just look at the last few lines of the article, um, despite increasing awareness during the year studied in the exclusion of confused patients from the study, a significant proportion of patients were completely unaware that transfusion was involved in their surgical treatment. Where possible, information about the likely use of blood should be included in preoperative information for patients. The issue of informed consent for transfusion might then be simplified. Um, as a matter of good medical practice, um, would it... Would it be right to understand that all patients who uh, receive a transfusion should be informed of that? Depending upon whether it's an emergency or not, it may be after the event in some cases rather than before. But there shouldn't, it shouldn't happen to you that patients aren't, aren't told. No, and I mean, certainly now, I would say it is included in the information that patients receive. But back in 1995... That was not the case. Um, and, and again, as a, just as a matter of general practice, general medical practice, uh, um, uh, it, um, if you have a patient who is, is conscious and capacitous, then it should be part and parcel of what they're being asked to make a decision about. Is, would, would you agree with that as a matter of general principle? Yes. yes. Um, now, obviously, transfusions may be required unexpectedly in emergency cases where a patient's been in a road traffic accident and you can't seek consent and you may need to use transfusion in order to save life. But in those circumstances, would it be good practice to ensure that the patient is informed at an appropriate stage, assuming they recover, that they have received a transfusion? I agree that would be good practice. Um, and then can I ask you to look at one other document... Um, DHSC 0006783 underscore 027. Have you got that for? First page up. So this is a patient information leaflet about receiving a blood transfusion. If we go to the last page, um, it looks from this as though it might have been produced by the, by the blood service. D d do you know whether that's the case or not? Yes, it was produced by the blood service um, to be used in hospitals. But um, it was felt that if the blood service produced it, there was a, somebody, there was a central organisation producing it and then providing it to all the hospitals for use on patients, rather than having hospitals design their own leaflets, which, of course, often happens within the health service. 
Um, and I, I'm not sure what the date is of this. If we look down the bottom of the page, it says this patient information leaflet was approved by the Chief Medical Officer's National Blood Transfusion Committee, planned review date 2005. Um, uh, does, does that help understand? It, it was clearly before 2005, but I don't know whether it was 2004, 2003. Yeah. But it's that it, kind of it might, might look from the bottom. Whether it's 2000. The, very bottom, uh, the slash 04 on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. That, that code seems to indicate 2004. Yes, it might well do. Yes. Probably the start of 2004, if it's 1004 or 2004. Um, and if we then go to the second page, we can see uh, it, it's, uh, it explains in the first paragraph that blood transfusion should only be used when really necessary. Uh, it talks about um, uh, asking the doctor to explain why you need a transfusion. If we go to the next page, there's a heading, Alternatives to Transfusion, Importance to Blood Transfusions Given Only When There's No Alternative, and then the last sentence of that paragraph, you may want to ask your doctor if these, that's other methods, are possible in your case. And then there's information about the safety of transfusions, and if we go on to the next page, we can see there's reference to hepatitis B, C, HIV, um, and... Uh, in the second paragraph, uh, a reference to uh, VCJD. Yes. Um, so would it be, again, right to understand that this was an attempt to um, try and ensure that patients were given some of the basic information, both about whether a transfusion was required or not, and about what the risks were that were involved in it? Yes, and... I should point out this was an initiative by the National Blood Transfusion Committee yeah. and the National Blood Service, I think, then took on the task of producing the leaflet. Yeah. And do you, do you recall whether this, was this a new initiative? It was a new initiative. Um, um, is, is there any reason why it couldn't have been done years earlier? Um, probably not. I'm going to turn then to a different topic, Dr Hewitt, and ask you about your involvement with the Skipton Fund. Um, I think you're aware that Mark Mildred gave evidence yes. to the inquiry, and I think you watched or read his evidence. Yes. Yes. And I'm not going to go through a lot of the details about the mechanics or the documents. I just want to ask you some broader issues about your involvement. So you were appointed to the Skipton Appeal Panel in early 2007. Yes. Um, you had, by that time, provided to the Skipton Fund's administrator a letter of advice about anti-D immunoglobulin. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not going to put, put it up on screen for the transcript. It's SKIP 5031 underscore 071. And then I think at a later stage in 2010, you provided jointly with was it Dr. Dash? Dr. Dash, yes. Um, a further advice uh, about intramuscular gamma globulin, including anti-D. Again, the reference to the transcript is SKIP 5031 underscore 070. Now, I'm not going to be asking you about the substantive content of that, but no. it's just a question of process, really. Um, did you end up sitting on appeals involving anti-D cases? Some of the appeals that came to the appeal panel did involve anti-D cases, yes. Um, and was there ever any consideration of the fact that you, you might be thought to be marking your own homework in, in, in some um, respect? Yeah, so <laughs> the first occasion uh, when I provided information to the uh, Skipton Fund was before I was appointed yes. to the appeal panel, and that was as an expert within NHSBT. Um, so you asked me about appeals involving anti-D. Um, I have always acted uh, in my capacity in the appeals panel without any influence about my employment with NHSBT. They're two completely separate issues. And although I have information and knowledge from my role with NHSBT, I did not let that influence my work on the appeal panel. Do, do you know um, whether applicants would have been given copies of, of those letters. We know the Skipton Fund relied quite heavily on, on, yes. on those, the, 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 the advice that you produced in their first stage decision-making. Um, 
uh, before any question of it getting to an appeal, appeal panel. Um, do, uh, do you know whether your advices were routinely provided to applicants? I believe not. The, the second uh, communication which was produced uh, jointly with Dr Dash, who was the medical director of uh, BPL, uh, was arose out of my concern that women were being advised by generally by hepatologists women with hepatitis C were being advised that intramuscular anti-D was the likely source of their infection. And the appeals were being made on the basis that they had been advised that by their hepatologists. So it, it must be right. And um, I was concerned uh, that these women were being given incorrect information and, and misled and, and given unrealistic expectations. Uh, about the source of their uh, hepatitis C infection. Um, and I think it arose because a professor of hepatology had written to the fund to say something to the effect of what is the situation with anti-D? And that was passed to me. And I asked Dr Dash to help me to produce um, something which could be provided in response to that inquiry as to why intramuscular anti-D uh, was not considered to be a risk uh, for hepatitis C transmission. Um, so if you like, that was offered to, to the fund to say, look, this is how uh, you've had this inquiry from a hepatologist, here's the information. Um, and I, I hoped that that would then be disseminated amongst hepatologists um, to try and increase the awareness about where, where the risk was, which was with intravenous anti-D. Um, subsequently, I think that moves were made for that information to be provided to individuals who had made an application to the Skipton or the EIBSS on the basis of intramuscular anti-D, but I can't confirm whether that always has been the case. Um, and then just on a, a, a point of detail, on those occasions, and it might well be rare occasions, where there were records which gave details of the the, the batches yes. that, that, that would, had been used in an individual's treatment. Would it be possible for you to tell from those records in principle if it was a BPL product or not? Or is that something that you, you couldn't decide? I could. Um, and it's important to say that the routine treatment provided in the UK uh, is NHS produced, either BPL or from the Scottish equivalent. Um, there were a very small number of cases uh, where intravenous anti-D was used for women, generally not, sometimes after childbirth, where, an, where a large dose of anti-D was required, which couldn't conveniently be given by numerous intramuscular injections. And that was provided using an intravenous product that was imported um, from the Irish Blood Transfusion Service, where intravenous anti-D was the routine uh, method of administering anti-D. And it, because it did not have a product license in the UK, it was imported on a, for use on a named patient basis. So there was a very small stock kept within England, and that was kept at the Collindale Blood Centre. And when it was required for these very small number of cases, which might be a, a woman after childbirth where there'd been a very large exposure to RH pos positive red cells, or a woman who had been inadvertently transfused inappropriately with RH positive blood when she was RH negative, then that product would re be requested on a named patient basis, and it would be issued from the Collindale Centre with the name and the hospital, the name of the patient and the hospital recorded in the central record. When it became clear that the Irish product had transmitted hepatitis C, the Irish service carried out a look back, which included notifying uh, all the organizations which had received the batches of intravenous anti-D. So a look back exercise was carried out within the English service for those named patients who had received the intravenous product. Um, 
Then just more broadly in relation to the, the way in which decisions were taken by the Skipton Appeal uh, Panel, there was no oral hearing, um, and, and that wasn't by choice of the panel, that was the way in which it was set up. Yes. Um, d do you recall whether that was a matter of concern to you and, and your colleagues on the panel? Um, I'm not certain it was in the early days of the panel, but when the Skipton Fund ceased to exist, um, then there were different schemes in each of the four UK countries. And one of the appeal panel members uh, is a member of the EIBSS appeal panel, but also the equivalent in Scotland, where they do hold oral hearings. And he, that member of the appeal panel has said that that has been very helpful. Um, and, and to just to explore why it might be helpful, obviously it, it might feel like a, a better process from the point of view of the appellant because they get a chance to present their case. It might feel a fairer process for them. Mm -hmm. But it will also give a chance where, where there aren't records which establish the position clearly, it will give a chance, won't it, for the panel potentially to assess the, the plausibility, the credibility of, of the account that they're being given when it, if it relies upon um, um, the, the perspective and recollections of the individual. Would you accept that? Precisely. The, the, appeal panel, the appeal panel will often say, we need some more information. We, we cannot make a decision on the information that's been provided. Uh, and we'll ask for additional information, such as a description from the claimant about the circumstances. And the appeal panel is very aware that some of these individuals are quite elderly, um, they may not, um, they probably wouldn't be able to pr produce a written account providing the information that the appeal panel really needs to see and being able to, to, to interview somebody uh, or talk to somebody face to face, it might be easier to, to extract the information which is really needed to, be, uh, to, con to provide what the panel really wants to hear. So it, it would be fair to say, because you, you, you now sit on the appeal panel for the EIBS. I'm still a member of the appeal panel, yes. Um, that you think it would be a good idea if there was an oral hearing process possible? I think it, it would help in some cases, yes. Um, the, can I then just ask you to think about I, IVDU cases, intravenous drug use mm. cases, where, where, where there was the possibility of some evidence of, of IVDU in, in the past? In practice, did any evidence of, of intravenous drug use effectively condemn an appeal to failure because it would be regarded as the more likely cause of hepatitis it C? It was regarded as the more likely source of hepatitis C on the basis of expert reports from, from others. But there have been cases where, where information has been provided on, on the application form, uh, sometimes by a clinician or by somebody reading what has been put in the medical record, that there is a record somewhere of intravenous drug use, which is denied by the claimant. Um, and sometimes there have been misunderstandings, clearly. Um, and in those cases, that the appeal panel does consider what is the, the strength of the information that we've been provided for and, and the counter-argument that that the claimant is, is making uh, in order to, to make a decision on the balance of probabilities. Uh, and then that leads me on to the question of balance of probabilities. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of how that works in practice in cases of which there must have been many when there are no, um, there are no records mm -hmm. at, um, to show the transfusion, either because the records have been destroyed or lost, um, or because there are some records, but the transfusion's not recorded in the patient notes, which we know from everything you've told yes. us in the context of the look back, is a, not an uncommon occurrence. So um, in, in, in those cases, how did the panel go about deciding whether it was satisfied on the balance of probabilities? 
that the root of the hepatitis C infection was a transfusion? So the panel would consider all the information provided um, and it would be very important to understand the episode during which transfusion was um, suggested had, had, had happened. So a full description of if it was an operation, an accident, uh, what sort of injuries there were. Um, and the panel, this is where it is a positive advantage to have people who are older <laughs> uh, on the panel because all the members of the panel are people who, are, who were practicing in the 1970s, 1980s and were aware of what practice was then uh, because we can't judge against what practice is now. We're talking about things that happened in the 1970s and 1980s. So using our knowledge of what the operation was or what the nature of the injuries were, how likely is it that transfusion would have been used? And in some cases, um, it is absolutely clear that transfusion would more likely than not have been used. And in that case, the panel would say, yes, on the balance of probabilities, a transfusion would have occurred, uh, whether there was documentary evidence or not. In other cases, uh, it is very clear that the nature of the injuries or the nature of the intervention would be highly unlikely to have required a blood transfusion. And then there will inevitably be cases that fall in the middle of that. Um, and I have to say that I think that the balance, the panel usually leans on... Sorry, the, the panel makes decisions by consensus. And, and there's always, I have to say, the medical experts always, nearly always agree. Uh, but in cases where the balance of probabilities is, is around 50% or there's a bit of dissension between the members, we would generally err on the side of the claimant. Um, and if you have... Um, and this is, a, I think, a scenario that was explored but with, with, with Mr Mildred. If you um, have, hypothetically, a case in which um, you might be aware that the appellant underwent a procedure for which there might be a one in five... One in five people undergoing that procedure might, might uh, um, have a transfusion. Um, four out of five would not... No records, no, no, nothing else to, to assist you in determining whether there was, as a matter of fact, a transfusion in the individual case. My understanding of the evidence that Mr Mildred gave was that in, in such a case, that wouldn't then be enough to satisfy the balance of probabilities. Is that right? I think that's correct, yes. What, even though it would be, if one in five people get a transfusion for that procedure, it's perfectly plausible that the individual could have yes. had a transfusion. And there, therefore, in those kind of cases, the absence of records effectively is, is, is going to um, lead to the individual not receiving a payment from the Skipton Fund. Yes. And um, what, what role in the Skipton Appeal Panel's decision-making does the, the absence of other risk factors, the absence of other plausible explanations for hepatitis C transmission play. If, you, if you've got someone in whom there's, there's no suggestion of intravenous drug use, they've got no tattoos, um, th th there's no obvious other explanation, how, how, how does that weigh in the balance? Um, generally not. And I have talked to a lot of blood donors who have infected with hepatitis C. And in a large proportion, there is no identified risk for the hepatitis C infection. It must have come from somewhere, but we can't identify where it came from. And exactly the same way, individuals who have no identified risk other than a blood transfusion may have acquired it in another way that we don't know about. Um, so the fact that they have no other identified risk mean, doesn't mean there isn't a, an, any other risk. Um, but of, of course, if there is no other identified risk and there is a situation where transfusion is plausible, then that would be taken into consideration in the decision. Um, 
I, I'm not sure I, I follow that exchange. Um, I mean, either the absence of other cause is taken into account and does make a difference, or it doesn't. Um, and the example which Council was, was putting to you, if I can put it this way, suppose that um, there's a one in three chance that this particular operation uh, would, or let's say a one in four chance that this particular operation would require a transfusion. So it's quite plausible that it might have done, but on the other hand, if that's all the information you have, it's three times as uh, more, more likely that there wasn't a transfusion. But then the, the claimant says, I, I believe I had a transfusion, and sets out reasons for the belief, uh, and adds, um, and there's no other reason uh, that I can think of why I might have had uh, hepatitis C. Um, so I haven't had uh, any injections, any needles, I haven't had a, uh, my ears pierced, I haven't had uh, a... a any intravenous drugs, um, etc. If you had, let us suppose, a set of statistics which were able to show, I don't know if there are such statistics, uh, that of the reasons that people give for having had hepatitis C, this is the, goes back to your donor uh, example, uh, suppose um, that, that you had uh, more than, um, say, one in five couldn't give you a proper reason why they had hepatitis C. They didn't know where it came from. Most of them perhaps hadn't thought where it might have come from. It could have come from any source. But there has to be a source somewhere. I, yes, I think I said that. Yeah. So... In that case, uh, are you going to say, well, this person, it's, it's not likely, more likely than not, that this person who's got no other source but a plausible transfusion, who could uh, simply have got hepatitis C from somewhere unknown, but more likely got it from a source, and there is no source but the transfusion, you'd say in the balance of probabilities, that would be a, a case for what? What would well, be the result? I, I thought the question I, I was being asked was where, where there wasn't any evidence that there'd been a transfusion. Uh, well, the, the, and, and I, I think it is, but the, but the evidence is, is here that there's a, an operation or some procedure which normally could involve a transfusion, but it's more likely not to. Yes. That's, that's the hypothesis. Yes, and in, and in that case, the panel would try to obtain more information about why, what was the situation which makes the individual understand they, they may have received a blood transfusion. So if an operation, it, it doesn't often arise that an operation has a one in four chance of having had a blood transfusion, but if it did, why do we believe why do, might we think that this particular operation required the blood transfusion? Were the particular complications? Was the patient so seriously ill that they had to be admitted to the intensive care unit afterwards, which might indicate that the operation had been unnecessarily complicated and therefore more likely to require a transfusion? Um, it's very hard to give, um, to give examples of that. Um, I mean, I was asked was the, oh, I forgot what I was asked now, the, that the, um, oh, the, the, the information that there was no identified risk, but that is taken into account, but that information is only as good as the, as the person who has taken the history. Uh, well, it's, it, actually, it's only as good as the person who's giving the history. Both. Um, uh, and you're not hearing from the person who's giving the history uh, under the English system. Exactly. What, what role, if any, in, in the appeal panel... Just, just, just one moment. You, you did say um, earlier, when we were talking about uh, the, the question of, of uh, lookbacks, I think, um, that uh, transfusions weren't historically included in discharge letter, or they may be, they might not be, Yes. what you said. Yes. And it said, unless you ask the patient, that information might not be available. So, and it might still not be available because the patient but, might not know so, either. So the, there, you, you were saying, well, the, the patient's 
ability to give information is uh, uh, vital in deciding effectively on the balance of probabilities that there was a transfusion. Because we asked the patient for more information about the particular episode, which will help, uh, which will help understand what the situation was, why a blood transfusion may have been required. So it, it comes down to having some effective method of talking to the patient to discover why precisely. Yes, they, they, they think and, and, and some patients have, you know, a large number of patients have been able to give a very good written description of the situation, which overwhelmingly would uh, lead to the appeal panel saying, yes, it, this sounds very likely that a blood transfusion was required, even though, though there's no information in the records, the GP hasn't got any records, uh, we believe that a transfusion would have taken place given the description that the claimant has, has provided us with. Thank you very much. And what I, th I think I was trying to say was that some claimants may not have the ability to convey that information in writing, which, which might better come out on a face-to-face -face interview. Be because they might not know what details could be important. Exactly. Whereas if yes. you've got them in front of you as, yes. as we, your we colleague could... in the Scottish Scheme House, you can ask the right questions exactly. and tease out the right details. Exactly. Um, what, what, what consideration, um, if, if any, is given by the appeal panel, was given by the Skipton Appeal Panel, is given by the EIBSS, to the fact that, as I think has become very clear in the evidence from, from you and your colleagues, past transfusion practices weren't necessarily the best, and transfusions have taken place that might be unnecessary or... Um, um, more by way of blood blood components may have been used than, 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 than could have been. Um, how does that factor into the decision-making process? Because you might have a case where you think, well, shouldn't need a transfusion, but shouldn't need doesn't mean it, it wasn't mm. given. Mm. And as I you know, practice has changed a lot. Um, so, again, that's important. That emphasises the importance of, of a witness statement either from the individual concerned or from somebody else who can give information of the situation uh, and, and what they observed at the time. Um, Mr Milt had a recollection um, of, of you saying uh, to, to the appeal panel that one would never ever give a transfusion to someone who'd lost less than a unit of blood. It, uh, now, you might have said you should never give a transfusion uh, or it might be right to say you should never give a transfusion in those circumstances, but do, as far as you can recall, is it your, your view and that you've communicated that you would never give a transfusion for, to someone who'd lost less than a unit of blood? I don't recall saying that, and there is always the situation where it appears that there is a bleeding episode uh, and a blood transfusion is started and then the bleeding is successfully brought under control when less than a unit of blood has been given. That, that, that's always possible. Um, I mean, as you've said, it's good practice not to give a transfusion, but there might be situations where somebody is, is anticipating. Uh, um, or indeed, there might be occasions, particularly if one goes further back into the past, where there's been a... Um, I think we've heard some evidence to suggest, possibly particularly in, in the context of women who've given birth um, uh, this idea that you might just top them up a bit yes um, which would now potentially be regarded with horror as a practice yes um, so th th those kind of cases might be cases where there wasn't a need, real need for a transfusion but someone might nonetheless have been given a small amount of, yes. of blood uh, um, it, it, just in relation to the the EIBSS scheme I is there any difference of approach between how the appeal panel uh, considered matters under the, the Skipton scheme as compared to the EIBSS scheme? No. So it operates effectively in the same way? Yes. Uh, the, the, the rules for the scheme, as far as I'm aware, haven't changed. Yeah. Uh, and, and then can I just ask you about the, the, the role you've had in, in relation to advice to the Department of Health on uh, eligibility for the Eileen Trust scheme. Mm. So we've seen in, in the document some examples of, of you um, uh, being asked by the Department of Health about um, 
uh, whether it can be established that someone yes. uh, had um, uh, received a transfusion that might have infected them with, with HIV. Did you have a formal role in that regard? And, and the HIV scheme has been very, was very, very different. Um, there was no formal uh, scheme administrator. The hepatitis C, the Skipton Fund, was dealing with much larger numbers of claims. But the HIV scheme dealt with very small number of claims. And I, with the hepatitis C scheme, uh, the Skipton Fund, uh, the, the, the rules set out that um, a documented history of blood transfusion, evidence of hepatitis C infection and uh, no uh, documented other risk would lead to an automatic payment. There was no requirement for the blood transfusion service to confirm that this was known to be a case of transfusion transmitted infection. The HIV scheme worked very differently in that usually it was required for the because HIV transmission was much less common than hepatitis C transmission, it was required for the blood service to say, yes, we know about this case, we have investigated it, and it is a case of transfusion transmitted infection. And those inquiries, do you know about this case, tended to come to me uh, from somewhere within the Department of Health, and it would be different people at different times. That there, there was no identified you know, this is the scheme, this is the scheme administrator. Uh, it was all, it all seemed to me to be quite haphazard. So over the years, I've communicated with different individuals within the Department of Health uh, about individual claimants under the HIV scheme. So would it, um, would it be right to understand it's, it's ad hoc requests to, that come to you for you to look at what if information or records the blood service might hold? to be able to say, well, we, you know, this is what we've got documented in relation to a possible implicated donation, um, or, or, or this is what we don't have any, we don't have any records to, to, to draw a line between the two. It's that kind of exercise, is it? Yeah, so if we had known about a case, we had investigated a case and agreed this was a case of HIV transmission through blood transfusion, then as part of that process, we should, we, the blood service, would have informed whichever clinician who made the inquiry, this case would fall within the Eileen Trust. And I certainly did that with the very few cases that we dealt with uh, after the introduction of the screening of blood. And I did it before when the, the fund was, uh, the trust was first established. More often than not, the inquiries latterly came from the Department of Health relating to <coughs> cases that were not known to the blood service and would then require an investigation because HIV transmission is very uncommon. And as I understood it, uh, payments would not be made unless the transfusion service confirmed that this was likely to be the source. Okay. Uh, I want to come then to the, the final topic um, that, that I wanted to ask you about, which is VCJD. Um, and I just want to, if I may, first of all, start by trying to get a simple simple as I can make it guide with yes. your assistance um, to um, to the background before then I ask about your direct involvement in issues so VCJD is a prion disease yes it's um, an invariably fatal disease with potentially a long incubation period yes and um, the agent responsible for the outbreak of BSC in cows is essentially the same agent responsible for the outbreak of BCJD in humans. Is that right in colloquial terms? Yes. Um, and um, the likely cause of, I think what I've seen described in, in some documents is the primary epidemic of BCJD is dietary exposure to food containing brain or spinal cord tissues from cattle infected with BSE. That's correct. Um, uh, but a secondary cause, as we'll come on to look at, um, can then be onward transmission through blood or blood products. And VCJD is a variant of 
what's sometimes called classic CJD. Yes, I, I, think, you'll, I think you're going to hear from Professor Ironside, yes, who will probably. give you excellent uh, information. But um, what used to be called classic CJD is, is more correctly, I think, called sporadic C CJD. But yes, when it was first described, it was called new variant CJD, and then it stopped being new and was called variant CJD. Um, um, and there's also, a, I think, a, a, a kind of CJD which is familial, it can be inherited. Exactly. Um, and then there have been other forms of CJD or other forms of transmission through, uh, not leaving aside blood blood components, through m medical treatment. So there's growth hormone treatment that has been a cause of transmission and, and, and surgical instruments. And that's sporadic and that's CJD. Sporadic CJD. Yes. So the form of CJD that can be transmitted through blood blood products is VCJD. Until the description of VCJD, and we only had sporadic and familial CJD, there had been no evidence, uh, and there had been some studies to look at whether there was a risk through transfusion of blood, uh, and there had been no evidence of that with sporadic and familial CJD. Um, uh, but it's now understood, and we'll look at how that emerged, um, or an overview of how that emerged, it's now understood that VCJD is capable of being transmitted through that route. That's correct. Um, now, uh, there have been a number of different organisations, bodies, groups involved in um, lo looking at VCJD, looking more broadly at CJD, um, looking at the, the, the possible link in relation to blood safety. So, departments of health... Um, Chief Medical Officers, the Advisory Committee on the Microbiological Safety of Blood and Tissue, SACTI, they've all had some role to play at various times. But there are some specific CJD-related yes. bodies. So there's the National CJD Research and Surveillance Unit. That's, its, I think, its current title, based in Edinburgh. Yes. Um, and then there was a committee called SEAC, S-E-A-C? SEAC, yes. So that's the Spongiform Encephalopathy Advisory Committee. Yes. I've got that right. And then there's the CJD Incidents Panel, and you were a member for a, um, of the CJD Incidents yes. Panel for a number of years. Yes, I was. Uh, um, now, I think your, your witness statement tells us that um, the presence of a variant with a different clinical and pathological picture from sporadic CJD was recognised in 1995. Yes. Um, and you've, you've referred to a description of the first cases of VCJD being written up and published in The Lancet in the summer of 1996. Yes, so the Department of Health had set up the National CJD Research and Surveillance Unit at some point, I think, following BSE. I, I think it was 1990, but as you yes. say, we'll, we'll be able to hear directly. Uh, and their remit was to look at all cases of CJD, and in doing so, they identified this new variant uh, during 1995 and it, the a description of those first 12 cases was published in 1996. Um, uh, and uh, you've said in your statement you first became aware of concerns about the possible risk of transmission of VCJD in early 1996. Yes. You refer to and we've, we have it described more fully from Dr Robinson um, the, the, there was a meeting on the 9th of April 1996 of representatives of SACTI and the CJD Surveillance Unit, which you didn't attend. Um, uh, I think you were away. I, think, I was on time. holiday, yes. Um, um, I'm not going to go to the document, uh, but it, the reference for the transcript is DHSC 00207830088. Mm -hmm. And the notes describe the meetings having been organised by Dr Robinson and Professor Cash following reports of this new variant. So that, that was on the 9th of April. There was then a SACTI meeting on the 16th of April 1996 at which you were present. So we'll just pick that up. It's NHBT 5088 underscore 013, please, Paul. So we've got the date, 16th of April 1996, and we can see that you were in attendance. Um, and the discussion about VCJD is on page six. Implications of a possible CJD disease 
variant for the UK transfusion services, and then it refers to the ad hoc meeting on the 9th of April. Um, uh, this was in recognition of a change in perception of CJD as potentially infectious until otherwise proven. It was recognised that one difficulty is that there's limited information available from animal experiments in relation to the ability of prion transmission by transfusion. Uh, in particular, the absence of information of transmission of BSC by blood between cattle was a cause of concern, and then there's a reference to concrete information being difficult to come by. It was agreed that the first priority at this stage um, was to improve the level of knowledge so that appropriate decisions could then be made regarding donor selection, handling of blood components, etc. The following actions were agreed. And then we've got a series of, 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 of points of, of agreement, um, of which the only one I'm really going to ask you about is the first. Dr. Mm -hmm. Robinson will ask MSBT for approval to do look back on recipients of blood donations from donors who'd subsequently developed CJD. And that was a task which you then became involved with? Yes. Um, and if we go to NHBT 0008485, we'll see that on the 22nd of April 1996, Dr. Robinson wrote to you um, uh, um, in relation to this issue, and if we pick it up in the... Uh, second paragraph, it says, I'm formally asking if you, together with Jack Gillen, if you could start drafting a proposal for a CJD look-back study prepared in a format that could be submitted to an ethical committee and also to obtain legal advice from Stephen Janice with regard to not informing recipients but only exchanging data with the CJD surveillance unit. I'll, I'll come on to the ethical matters mm -hmm. um, in, in a few minutes. Um, there's then reference to looking as though the MSBT, Jeremy Mehta, so that's mm -hmm. the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and the Minister are now keen to go down this route. Jeremy has seen Peter Flanagan's notes of the Edinburgh meeting as anxious for us to follow through with a proposal for a limited CJD look back. Uh, it was Jeremy's suggestion that any proposal where the recipients will not be informed needed to be submitted for ethical committee approval and legal advice. So that, that, that's the issue we'll come back on. But that, that is the source of your understanding that um, it, it had, had been a, essentially a requirement of the Department of Health that ethical committee approval be sought. Absolutely, yes. Um, now, th this then translated into the Transfusion Medicine Epidemiology Review, which I'm going to call TMER. Everybody calls it mouthful. TMER, yes. Um, am, 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 am I right in understanding that is in fact still ongoing in some form? Yes. Is it now under the auspices of the Surveillance Unit in Edinburgh? Um, so when it was set up, um, it covered all types of CJD, um, and subsequently, when evidence arose that variant CJD had been transmitted through blood, that was removed from the research study because it became a, a public health uh, issue. Uh, but the TMER still exists uh, for sporadic and familial CJD. Um, and then in relation to TMER, um, you said in, in your statement, its main aim is to try and establish whether there was any link between VCJD and blood transfusion. That's correct. Um, it wasn't designed to investigate links with fractionated plasma products. Yes. Why was that? Because that's not what we were asked to investigate. Um, um, and it, it also included within it looking at sporadic CJD. And from, uh, familial. Um, and then you've told us in your statement, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try and summarise them with your assistance, try and get an understanding of what was being yeah. done in, 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 in relatively layperson's terms. You've told us in your statement that the first and most direct aim of the TMER was to establish whether individuals diagnosed with CJD, CJD had acted as blood donors, and if so, to trace the donations and identify the fate of the blood components through to their final destination. Yes. Is that accurate? Yes. So cases of VCJD, all cases of VCJD, would be reported to the TMER by the surveillance unit. That was, that was to the blood services by the, the yeah. surveillance unit, yes. Um, 
In relation to sporadic CJD, it was a more limited category of cases that were reported, I think, only where relatives or next of kin knew that, that they'd been a blood donor. Yes, because there are a larger number of cases of sporadic CJD. Um, and, and then, uh, as I understand it, if, if blood components from the donor were recorded as transfused, that would be notified to the blood centre. Through a look-back process through, with exactly. the hospital, yes. Um, and then the identity of the recipient where that could be established would be forwarded to the surveillance unit for what you've described or what the documents describe as passive surveillance purposes. Mm. Now, we will obviously ask the surveillance yes. unit in due course, but do you, what, 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 again, in, in basic terms, does, does that mean? That means that the names were checked against the uh, surveillance unit's uh, register of cases of CJD and continue to be checked at intervals in case a case developed in the future. And secondly, that if and when the individual who'd been identified uh, died, that a copy of the death certificate was passed to the surveillance unit so they could examine the information on the death certificate um, and use that. But there was no, there was no active surveillance, no way of saying, uh, no way of following what happened to the patient this year, next year, following year. So that, that was the first part um, of, of, of the study, the, the more conventional look back. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll come on to the question of notification or non-notification yeah. to recipients in, in a few minutes. Uh, and then your statement tells us that the second part of the TMER study um, was, a re was a reverse TMER, so it's known as the RTMER mm -hmm. part of it. Um, um, uh, can you just, again, explain in, in fairly simple terms, yes. if you, if yes. you can, um, how that worked? So this was the opposite, and this is exactly the same thing when a, the blood service is informed, here is a patient who's developed an, something which could have been transmitted by blood transfusion, could you investigate the donors? So it was work we did with other infections. So the starting point was a patient with CJD who had a history of blood transfusion. Um, and then it would be a case for the blood service to uh, identify, to ask the hospital concerned to identify what blood or blood components have been transfused and then to identify the donors who had provided those. So this was dependent on information about the person who developed variant CJD and having received a blood transfusion, information about which hospital the transfusion had taken place because there is no database of people who've received a blood transfusion. Uh, the blood service would need to ask the hospital concerned is there a record of transfusion for this person? Can you give us the details so we can now trace the donors? Um, and, and you've described, I think, in your statement that it effectively acted as a double check. Yes. And as a matter of fact, no cases were identified through the RTMER process that had not already been identified in the look back arm. Exactly. Which gave us confidence that, that it was working. Um, now, um, there are a number of ethical issues or dimensions to this, hence the requirement for ethical approval from a, a local um, a ethical research committee. Um, the, the, one issue of concern was the question of confidentiality. Um, and you've described in your statement the use of control cases. Again, could you just help us understand how that worked? Um, yes. I had not appreciated, actually, before I'd reviewed all the papers, that there had been a concern. I knew there was a concern at the Department of Health about it becoming widely known uh, that... Um, Variant CJD might be associated with blood transfusion. Uh, and I remember that we were asked not to include anything, anything about CJD in the title of the study, which is why it has such a, you know, a bland title. Um, and I understand from what I've seen since that there were real concerns that if the blood service informed a hospital about a, a blood component that they wanted to trace, um, and the, the knowledge that this was in relation to variant CJD, that that might cause a lot of alarm, um, and and they, uh, and might 
lead to the individual who had received that blood component being given that information when the ethical advice was not to do that. Um, and there were a variety of, of, of strategies, I think, being considered. And in conjunction with uh, the surveillance units, uh, we agreed that the best way would be to include in the study not just the cases we knew of variant CJD, but control cases who were patients with other diagnoses who had been blood donors, um, whose blood had been issued to hospitals. And when we issued a request to a hospital to trace a blood component, it would be made clear that this might be from a case or from a control. And because that information was not known to the blood service, um, nor was it known to the hospital, and so it, it emphasised the importance of not giving any information uh, that might suggest it, it, it was a variant CJD case. Now, two e um, ethical components um, of the, 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 the TMER was, um, first of all, that the surveillance unit would be passing on personal details of those diagnosed with CJD to the blood services in the absence of patient consent, because yes. it wouldn't be possible to obtain patient consent. The patient would either be deceased or would be beyond the stage at which they could give a capacitous yes. consent because of the stage at which VCJD would be diagnosed. So that was one concern. The second was um, that the way in which this was set up didn't lead to any contact being made with the recipient to tell them that they had been in receipt of blood or blood components from somebody who had then been subsequently been diagnosed with VCJD. Yes, that's correct. And that, that was one of the main ethical concerns, as I understand it. Yes. Um, so ethical approval was sought and obtained from the Lothian Ethical Research Committee, and that's, it, that's because that was the local research committee for the surveillance unit based in Edinburgh, and they'd had some previous dealings with the surveillance unit, so they had a degree of familiarity with CJD issues. Is that right? Yes. Uh, but could I just add yes. that... that um, we had asked for ethical advice before we made the submission to the Ethics Committee. Uh, and um, my understanding is that it, it was in 1996 that you sought ethical advice from Professor Ian Kennedy. Yes. We don't have, I think, a copy of that advice, um, but it's referred to in, to, in some later correspondence yes. in, in 1999 when the issue was looked at again. Um, if we just look at the, the, um, the documentation in relation to the proposal submitted to the Lothian Ethical Research Committee um, and the grant of ethical approval, it's NHBT 0008903, please. Um, so this is the proposal for um, the look-back study. Um, uh, I, if we go over the page... We'll see there's a description uh, and on the next page of the different types of CG, CJD. And then if we go to page four, there's the heading transmission by blood transfusion um, uh, and, and, and setting up the position as at that date, which was that CJD had not been shown to be transmitted by transfusion of blood or plasma products. And then if we go over to page six, We've got a reference under the heading UK position to what had been discussed and agreed in the April 1996 meeting. And then page seven sets out the proposal. Um, no evidence that CJD in either its classical or new variant forms is transmitted by blood transfusion. Nevertheless, information in relation to the potential transmissibility of CJD by blood transfusion is very limited. Um, the absence of information severely restricts ability of the transfusion services to provide definite reassurance that the new variant form of CJD does not possess a threat to the blood supply. Furthermore, further definition of donors who might be at risk of developing CJD is required, and so on. Uh, and so um, the, the, the purpose was to try and establish whether or not CJD was, was or could be transmitted by blood transfusion. Yes, because there, there was a, a huge concern that variant CJD was so different from sporadic CJD 
there couldn't be reassurance that because sporadic CJD was not transmitted by blood, the same would uh, be the case for variant CJD. Um, and then if we go over the page to page eight, um, the bottom half of the page uh, um, describes the, the, uh, the basic way in which the, the uh, programme would operate. And then if we go to page nine, we get to the issue of non-notification of the recipient. So second paragraph, it's recommended that the limited look back would take place without notification of the recipient. The reasons are as follows. One, there is no screening test available which can detect the possibility of an individual being susceptible to development to CJD in the future. Two, there is no diagnostic test available to detect whether an individual has been infected with the agent which causes CJD. Three, the diagnosis of CJD can only be made with certainty by examination of pathology specimens post-mortem. Four, there is no intervention which can be offered to individuals detected to be at risk of developing disease or to those who've already developed symptomatic disease. For all the above reasons, it is considered unethical to notify any individual who has received blood from a donor who subsequently developed at CJD. And then if we go over the page... The second paragraph says it should be noted that should there be any change in the capacity to diagnose the disease or if any intervention becomes available in the future, then the transfusion services should have in place a mechanism for contacting the identified recipients. So the proposal when it started was non-notification of recipients, but there was a recognition that the situation might change. Yes, and I, th I think number one should have been there is no evidence that there is transmission through through blood transfusion, and that should have been included in the uh, the proviso if information becomes available, which suggests that it has been transmitted through blood transfusion. That would be a very significant reason for changing from non-notification. Um, and, and then, if we can just look at the next page, bottom paragraph. And um, there's a heading: exclusion of donors considered at risk of developing CJD. The transfusion services must exercise a high level of suspicion about possible transmissibility of CJD by blood and err on the side of caution in deciding whether to accept donations from individuals believed to be at risk of developing CJD. To wait until a causal connection is established on a scientific basis may not be regarded as acting with reasonable care. Thus, decisions about selection of donors must not be delayed pending results of the limited look back that must be taken in light of current knowledge and guidelines. Now, it could be said that's a, a very different approach to the approach taken, for example, in the 1980s in relation to HIV, where, and I'm sure you're familiar from your knowledge of events, actually, issues about no conclusive proof, mm -hmm. no, no, no causal connection, no evidence, etc. Uh, feature large in the story of what was decisions there. This appears to propose a different approach, which is essentially the opposite, to, to err on the side of caution until the contrary is proved. And I think this has been mentioned in, by earlier witnesses as well. This is a reflection of the precautionary principle, which I think really became prominent after the Phillips inquiry into BSE. Um, and then if we go to page 15 of this document, um, this is, as, as a matter of formality, the grant of ethical approval on the 6th of January 1997 by the Lady and Ethical um, um, Research Committee. Um, now, in 1999, you then sought further ethical advice. Um, first of all, from Professor Kennedy and then from Professor Len Doyle. Yeah. Look, we'll look at the, 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 the correspondence in a moment. But what had changed that led you to want to get further advice on the question of notification? Uh, so there were, over the years, between 1996 and 1999, uh, a variety of discussions, predominantly within the CJD incident panel, about risk assessments which were being carried out in relation to what is the risk that variant CJD uh, could be transmitted through blood or blood components. And the early risk assessments uh, did, not really, uh, did not really lead to many uh, believing that 
the risk was such that individuals who we were identifying in the TMER uh, should be informed that they had been put at risk. I think over, the, the, over that period, the risk assessments changed. But I think one of, the, one of the main reasons was that we in the blood services were trying to adopt the precautionary principle. And we were saying, we are identifying people who we know have developed, who have received blood components from individuals who later developed variant CJD. We don't have the evidence that it is transmitted through transfusion, but we would not want any of those individuals to become blood donors themselves, uh, because we would not want that blood to go into the blood supply. Um, and it was, that was the blood services uh, stance on that. Um, but no decision had been made uh, about notification of these recipients. So if they didn't know, how could they not become blood donors? Now, admittedly, many of them would not have been eligible to be blood donors, but some of them would have been. So the blood services said, a decision hasn't been made, but we are going to do something to make sure that if any of those individuals donated blood, it would not be used. And it was quite a complex thing to do, but that's what we did. This is the flagging. This is the system, flagging. Is right? So this is basically, um, even though they were not blood donors, registering them as blood donors, and that itself led to concerns, and then ensuring that should any of those individuals who would be eligible to give blood, um, should any of those individuals uh, attend to donate blood, that blood would not be used. And then following that, if any of those individuals had attended to donate blood and become blood donors, the blood service would then have a duty to tell them, we cannot accept blood donations from, from you for this reason. So that was the dilemma we were in, and that was the dilemma we presented to the incident panel, uh, and to say, look, we are going to take this action. We are going to ensure none of these individuals, if they donate blood, the blood would be used, and if they do come to donate, we would be duty-bound to then tell them, because we couldn't continue to let them donate blood in the knowledge that, that, that we couldn't be using it. And then you'd have a situation in which some recipients of implicated donations would have found out that they had been recipients and indeed that that had been known to the various agencies involved for some time, but they'd have found out through the happenstance of coming to donate blood and then others would remain in ignorance. Exactly. Um, and, and then I think um, if we look at NHBT 0001259, This is a letter from you to Dr. Robinson dated the 5th of December 1997. Mm. Um, we can see, um, if, if we just leave the whole page up, please, please, Paul. We can see in the second paragraph, you refer to the advice sought from Professor Kennedy, uh, and you've set out the advice there, yes. so even though we don't have it in the, the direct form of a, of a document from, from Professor Kennedy. This was your account of it n n not, not long after. Um, uh, um, and for reasons they're given, no, no evidence CJD has been transmitted. So you, you were there putting that as the number one reason. Yes. Two, no screening tests. Three, the only diagnostic test is a brain biopsy. Four, no therapeutic intervention. Um, but then if we look at the first paragraph, we can see that something had triggered you to write to Dr. Robinson, which is, is this right in understanding that, that those who had received implicated tissues a different approach was being taken and they were being notified and you were concerned about the difference of approach is that is that correct yes um these are specific tissues yes. eye tissues which are which were and are considered to be high risk so it was a different tissue one was yes. blood and one was eye but but still there was a, a disparity um and so um over the page Um, you, in the last paragraph, say, as different policies have been implemented with respect to these two groups of recipients, I think it's important to understand the reason for these differences. You ask for it to be looked at, again, by MSBT, and you say you're uncomfortable that two different decisions have been taken. Um, 
now we, we, we can follow through MSBT decisions um, on paper or with other witnesses, so I'm not going to ask you to, to, to look at those. Um, but in 1999, you um, sought ethical advice again. Uh, if we start with NHBT 0017407, please. Um, this is your letter to Professor uh, Ian Kennedy. Um, uh, you refer to a conversation um, in May 1996. Um, you set out the, 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 the previous history. And then if we look at the, uh, the penultimate paragraph on the page, it says you raised two important caveats at the time. Firstly, if there was any change in the capacity to diagnose the disease. And secondly, if any intervention became available, then the means to contact identified recipients must be in place. Um, and then, uh, bottom paragraph, that's picking up at the end of the second line, I've been asked to write to you again to ask whether you consider that the ethical advice now needs reviewing. Two factors are relevant. Firstly, a test which might have application as a diagnostic test in the future has been developed by Professor Collins at Imperial College School of Medicine. Um, uh, it's set out there, it's still a research um, procedure at that stage. And then the second factor is more complex, and you go on to describe what we've just been discussing, yes. the fact that the blood transfusion service was taking steps to uh, flag individuals on their, their own records to ensure that blood donations from them weren't, weren't, weren't used. Um, and, and then we see the bottom paragraph... Uh, you say, I've been asked to write to you and ask whether you could review the situation and the advice you've given in the past in light of new developments. Um, and then if he's unable to, you ask if he could suggest the name of another expert. Now, I don't think we've got anything suggesting that Professor Kennedy did give advice again on this second occasion. No, and I, I apologise for the fact that documentation isn't there. I don't mind. But um, you're probably going to go on to... Yeah, so you... It, it, um, whatever the response from Professor Kennedy was, and, and it m m m may have been a, a, a telephone response and therefore not documented, mm. you then made contact um, with another uh, um, professor of, of ethics, yes. Professor Doyle, um, and we have a letter from him at NHBT 0004392 underscore 002. Um, so it's December the 20th, 1999, um, and it refers to a meeting with you and Dr. Knight. And just, if you can just tell us who Dr. Knight is. Dr. Knight uh, is a consultant neurologist at the CJD Research and Surveillance Unit. Um, so it refers to a meeting. Um, the second paragraph says, as I understand it, the reasoning behind the original decision not to inform recipients or donors in the circumstances described was based on the premise that not doing so could in no way impinge on their interests. Uh, um, this is because of the uncertainty surrounding the mode of transmission and the lack of a screening or diagnostic test to diagnose infection. The issue of the lack of any effective intervention has also been mooted as a justification for non-notification. Um, and then Professor Doyle's advice um, then is, I would discount this as relevant to any new policy about notification. Many terminally ill people both need and want to know confirmation about their diagnosis and prognosis despite the absence of effective treatment. They require such information because of decisions about their lives or deaths which they may wish to make on its basis. It's impossible with any certainty for clinicians effectively to judge who these individuals are or what kind of information they require, even when they're actively treating them. Indeed, there are obvious difficulties in assuming that when some patients reject information which they may find distressing, they can be said to be making an informed choice about their rejection. It certainly cannot just be assumed that recipients or donors who are linked to new variant CJD will not wish to be informed of this fact, uh, if anything could be said to practically turn on the provision of such information. And then over the page, he says, therefore, the key moral issue is whether or not there is, A, evidence or the appearance of evidence that there is a link between NV CJD and blood, and B, an effective diagnostic test. And then he takes each in turn... Um, if I understood you and Dr. Knight, there's now very little sound evidence that new variant CJD can be transmitted by blood. 
The problem is that the NBA has adopted a policy about the non-use of the blood of the recipients of potentially infected blood, which entails that they must be informed when they're eligible to give it. The department has also insisted that as the medium of potential transmission, white cells be removed from blood for transfusion. And that's the process that Dr. Williamson talks yes. about of lymphoid depletion. Yes. Both suggest, decisions suggest, and will certainly do so to the public, that there is evidence of transmissibility. Therefore, recipients or donors who are told that their blood cannot be used must be informed of the circumstances surrounding this decision. On the one hand, if they're given no explanation, they'll rightly demand it. On the other hand, if they're told nothing and allowed to give blood, which is then simply destroyed, they would be doing so under false pretenses. This is both immoral and illegal. If anything should now be clear in the practice of healthcare in Britain, it is that deception is not an option for good clinical practice or public policy. Um, he then goes on to discuss the emergence of the screen or diagnostic test. Um, uh, um, I, won't, I won't read that aloud. Um, but, but in any event, his, his advice effectively was different from the advice that he'd previously received and was to the effect that he believed that recipients should be notified. Yes, and I think I, think I was... I think it was quite an eye-opener for me that there's no such thing as this is ethical and this isn't. There are different opinions amongst ethicists. Um, and Professor Doyle felt very differently uh, from the previous ethical committee, both ethical committee and Professor Kennedy. So I, I note the time. Um, I've got about probably another 20 minutes or so, um, 20, 25 minutes on, on CJD. Well, very well. Well, let's uh, take a break now until 2 o'clock. Thank you. 2 o'clock. <laughs>